Hello and welcome everybody to the latest episode of Cook and Liver Team, um, a show where I'm gonna cook and my uh, my guest is gonna uh, talk about liberty. Today with me I have uh, Boško Boško Karadžov, uh, who is a philosopher by training. Uh, he is also a professor of philosophy as well. So um, welcome, Boško. Thank you very much, Simon, for this opportunity. Uh, it's it's a very nice ambient. Uh, you are cooking. I speak about philosophy and liberty, about some kind of. Uh, internal uh, values and this old stuff uh, reminds me of uh, Greek feast of Greek symposiums I don't know if you're familiar the Greeks they try to celebrate life they make some kind of, of symposium very specific type and they have a two parts in these symposiums in this feast they have a part which they're trying to please the senses uh, your job today to please the senses with good uh, culinary art and with your uh, culinary professionalism and the second part of this uh, Greek uh, symposium was the part that we call phronesis and they will try to please the, the, the spirits or please the mind and in the second part of this Greek symposium was a part they were talking about philosophy, talking about values, talking about internal questions and your show is a little bit remind me some kind of web 2.0 old Greek symposium where the guest on this symposium trying to philosophize, trying to speak about uh, relevant stuff, but through the culinary art and through the pleasing of, of the senses. I'm very glad that I'm part of your show and I, I big thanks for your invitation. Um, well, I, I, I told you he, he's a professor of philosophy, he's gonna philosophize, so this is only the start, just so you know. But before we go into the, into the uh, talking part, uh, first I have to tell you what we are doing and this is what I'm gonna be cooking today is uh, something called proya but that's very basic in a sense very Macedonian very basic thing uh, easy to make but we are gonna we're gonna mix it up and we're gonna make like uh, sort of 10 different uh, types of molds usually the the proya part, uh, the proya goes into one uh, one big batch but I'm gonna put this in cupcakes which means that we are gonna have like 12 different uh, different um, uh, sort of dishes at the same time and this is very nice to do with your children because all you, all, all you need is like the different parts of each cupcake and everybody can sort of make their own mix so for that I need like a regular flour, wheat flour uh, I need a few eggs and um, uh, baking powder some, uh, some oil and some yogurt and you just mix that up uh, put, the, uh, put everything in the cupcake molds after that you, you make your own cupcakes and and that's pretty much uh, it, you know. So I, I will start. I will start cooking right now, and you'll see what comes up uh, out of it. Um, uh, but you know, while I'm doing the cooking, I want to ask uh, uh, Boško. You know, he he mentioned um, from the get go the philosophers and uh, ancient Greeks. But like, when when we think about um, uh, culinary in general, uh, can can we connect that? Uh, to, to art in a way, can we connect that to philosophy somehow? What, what's your take on, on, on culinary? Yes, yes, uh, the philosophers uh, from the beginning of the time, they're trying to think about the, the nature of beauty. And you know, there's a specific philosophical discipline, it's called aesthetics. And in the history of aesthetics, in the history of this arrangement, trying to, to answer the questions about the beauty, uh, the philosophers, starting from Plato, starting from Aristotle, trying to explain what is the, the purpose of beauty. And you know that the Greek term for uh, the art that's trying to, to think about the beauty is uh, aesthetic. Uh, but you know the name aesthetics comes from the Greek word aesthesis, which means uh, sensual reception. And uh, aesthetic or, or art is connected with senses. And when you cook, when you're a culinary expert and you, when you smell good stuff and when you eat good stuff, uh, then you please the senses. And if the art is connected with the senses, it's a very profound uh, explanation that uh, culinary also may be considered as one of, one of the arts. Because in the middle period, in the sometime uh, 12th or 13th century, we also have some kind of classification of, of the arts. And in this classification of the arts, classification of the art was uh, by our senses. And this medieval uh, philosopher thinks that art can be divided in art, which please our uh, sensual senses or visual senses, visual art, art that please our auditive sense, auditive art, such as music. And they speak about the third art, 
art that please our sense for smell and art that please our sense for taste and probably you will recognize this kind of art is, is culinary art that uh, culinary was in the most of the historical period was really considered regularly fine art because the art was divided by the sense they art please and probably your audience and, and you were asked the, the questions that follow what about the the sense of touching, which art is connected with this. If the eyes are connected with visual arts, if our ears are connected with auditive arts, is if our capacity to smell and to, to taste is connected with culinary arts, what do you think it's connected with our sense of touch and touching? What do you think? Which kind of art is here? You're, you're putting on. You're putting me on the on the spot, but I, I cannot give a proper answer. So I, I will. I will not play the game. I will I not play know. the game with you. It's, uh, it's uh, appropriate for this show, but it's about erotic art, and we can we can divide. Everything is a, in a libertarian world. Yes, in, a, in a libertarian show like this, it is very much appreciated. So. If if we speak. Uh, or from our perspective through the senses, then the legitimate form of art is a culinary art, erotical type of, of art, a visual art and audit type of art. But through the historical uh, period, so we have very different aspects of art. Uh, we don't speak anymore that art is place where the beauty is lives. It's not only about the senses. Today we have a, a aesthetic of ugliness, we have a political, artivistic type of art, and today it's, it's very complicated and different to speak. But in the beginning of the of uh, philosophical attempts to try to explain uh, what is art and what is the connection between art and senses, we have this kind of uh, legitimate uh, approach to the art, which culinary is one of the fine, fine arts. Today it's a little bit different, but still we have a very good uh, chiefs, very good uh, uh, masters of, of uh, culinary. We still have a capacity to enjoy in, in eating, uh, to enjoy in smelling good stuff, and I think it's a it's a it's legitimate to speak about uh, culinary as an art form especially when you're dealing with some great great culinary experts such as you <laughs> such my wife <laughs> such a other type of, of culinary expert that put the one i don't know if you agree with me the the most uh, significant uh, ingredient in in cooking the love yeah the love for, with, for with cooking that, with that i will agree yes. i my, my rule with cooking is something that i cannot do um, that I cannot do at home. That's what something that I always buy outside. But what I, what I can uh, make at home, I don't buy, um, you know, in a in a restaurant or something. But uh, I always think of the love part and the secret ingredient. Yeah, and love, the, only, love. the only the only the only time that I would um, say I would make it for myself something that I I I will it would be really hard to make and i know it would be subpar to a restaurant or something like that i only only the love part the makes love it part ma makes it worse the passion part hegel one of the german philosophers uh, he said nothing great in the world is uh is kin to the life without passion and without love in every profession in philosophy profession in, in teaching with kids if you don't have love if you don't have passion for something you don't have capacity to make of them to be aesthetical, profound, to be taste, to be good. I think that love is a very, very significant part, but love is equal with something that we can in philosophy call uh, uh, passion or, or I don't call philosophical eros, that kind of stuff. Passion for something, flame inside you. And if you have a passion for cooking, the cooking will be, will be great. And now I probably will witness that kind of stuff. I, I don't know how, how, how good it would be because, you know, I'm under pressure here. So I, I have sort of an excuse if this is subpar, but, you know, that's me <laughs> get, get, getting the get out of jail uh, free card, you know. Uh, before, before I continue, so uh, I already have uh, mixed this up. That's basically it. So I will start pouring it in the cupcake, um, uh, in the cupcake molds. The, the thing is, I have uh, here some bacon and one, one option is to put like the bacon around like this so few few of the a few of the cupcakes will be something like that so the the point is you you just you're with your children and you just spend 20 minutes and they're enjoying you know mixing everything up so it, it's a fun fun way to spend time with, with your children but um, um, it's, it's, uh, since we mentioned children and like uh, let, let's let's go with the difference in uh, in, in generation the generation gap like 
because you are interacting by teaching with them all the time what would you say that it's different from the time uh, you were you were you know in high school or in, in faculty and uh, at the university and today culture wise regarding what's the biggest difference oh, Simon, this, is a, this is a very great question it's a very profound question and i think it's a very very relevant question i work like a philosophy teacher of maybe more than 15 uh, years. I work like a philosophy teacher in European University. I work like a philosophy professor in Institute Euro Balkan. I work like a philosophy professor in Veles Gymnasium. I work in informal schools also like a professor of philosophy. And uh, I can witness with my experience that today we have a very, very, very different, very different kin uh, kids, very different uh, population. But I think that this difference is completely uh, implicated but what happens in our media media world I don't know if you're familiar one interesting American sociology of, of education it's called Mark Prensky he wrote very instructive uh, study of sociology of education this study it's called on the horizon and Mark Prensky thinks that we today are witnessing uh, some kind of new kids there are kids which was born after 2000 <laughs> some kind of generation uh, the, uh, new kids. the new kids and they are from the terminology of Mark Prensky the digital natives and what that means that they are digital uh, digital natives that means that they are not uh, growing up with digital environment they are uh, hooked on digital environment uh, they are so connected to this new digital world. They are so connected to Web 2.0 platforms for technological and sociological endorsement. They are so hooked up on uh, their mobile phones. They are so hooked up on their digital environment. And they live in such a different uh, world, which we philosophers call different ubiquity because of the gaming industry, because of the media sharing platforms, because the, all of this digital world. And when your environment is, is changing, you're changing your uh, neoplasticity, you're changing your cognitive approach, you're changing your type of uh, uh, attention you're completely changed because we have in history that kind of changing of the media because the media world of our uh, current children is completely different from the media world of our generation and because the media world is different uh, i think and much of the uh, contemporary scholars think that we have a very very different kids the kids which are digital natives and the kids which are digital and the other type of people are digital migrants and we the professor is much more like a digital migrants and we're trying to go in their world and we're trying to speak with them but we speak different languages digital migrants and digital nati natives speak completely different language and that's why in uh, in education today uh professor was a very very problematic how to how to endorse attention uh, today's kids have low attention disorders because they are not used to to listen 45 minutes of ex cathedra lecture. They're much more used to, to some kind of digital mind. They're used to the, to the quick uh, browsing, uh, to the hypertextual thinking. They're different. They're very, very different. But what, uh, what happens? Most of the, the classical scholars, of the classical professor, they're, they're saying that uh, the new kids are, are much more stupid, that the new kids are problematic, that the new kids uh, doesn't uh, know how to appreciate the educational values. But I think that's not the problem. I think the problem is because the teacher community is not adopted to the new digital environment that kids are living now together. And I think this digital environment, uh, to, to make some kind of educational results, I think it's a must to, uh, to, to recreate the classroom in the world that kids live today together. How would you recreate that? Uh, I think that we can recreate the classroom if we intend into the world that kids live today. The kids uh, live today in the world of pop culture and we must introduce elements from pop culture into the education. I don't know if you're very familiar, Simon, in our classical classes of, of literature, the most uh, recent uh, book that kids in high school must read is book from 1953, uh, The Stranger by Albert Camus. Yeah. 53, 1953 is a very, very, very long time it's a, it's ago. A it's, it's a very, a very different, 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 world. Different, different world. Today kids doesn't have any class uh, uh, connected with the movie industry, with the movies and with the films. 
They are learning about some kind of stuff. We prepare our children how to live in 19th century, not in 21st century. And my idea is to digitalize education. What that means to digital education? It means to recreate the classroom. Use everything that kids use today. Use Netflix for education. Use pop culture for education. Use hip hop for education. Use protest poetry for education. Use graffiti for education. Use comic books for education. Use every aspect of uh, that kids are hooked today for their own purpose, for their own benefit, for their own good and something that digital migrants, we professor and digital natives to speak some kind of identical languages and when you when we will succeed in that kind of stuff we will have motivated motivated kids i'll try on, on my classes when i speak about uh, poetry nobody wants to listen to me but when i connect poetry with protest poetry with hip-hop culture with something that happens in maybe in the united states then i find very very interesting result because i have something that is very uh, needy in communication some kind of attention uh, formation of attention and when we have formation of attention, that is very easy to, to work with this new generation. I think, uh, and I will, uh, I will come in short, today kids are not uh, stupid kids. Today kids are complete and uh, different kids. And we must appreciate and we must uh, adapt to this kind of differentness. Uh, this kind of differentness is a result of the different media that we are dealing today. It's my little opinion. I, I love the, the, the part you mentioned about poetry because I I never was able to understand poetry until uh, and, and respect poetry at the same time until I saw, I remember it was um, Dead Poet Society with uh, Robin Williams and that's like an <laughs> excellent movie. It's 11 out of 10 and and when when they go out and I remember they read Tennyson and someone someone like, like that and all of a sudden I, I understood poetry for the first time and I was like Yes, and coming back to you, you have to connect, uh, connect uh, whatever you wanna. The value aspect of yeah. education with something that is familiar for for them, yep, I agree. something that is a part of, of their culture because they are living in the in a completely different world that uh, maybe you your younger. Yep. I when I live with okay, we have only one TV channel, you know the <laughs> the uh, radio television scopy on the second channel was a, was a policeman that calls <laughs> got back on the on the first channel. We live in completely different media world. I think that the media is. The message. So I think that we now live in Marshall McLuhan world, not in the Gutenberg galaxy. You know, the Gutenberg galaxy was a galaxy that was connected with with the reading experience, uh, and uh, the major media was the the reading and the books media. Today, this is not the, the major media. Today, the library as a concept is uh, how called it's overthrown. Today, we live in digital ubiquity. What that means? That means that we're living be because of the new media. We live in completely different ontology, completely different world, and this completely different world influence to our cognitive aspect. And that's why our kids today is different. And if we don't adjust to that kind of differences, we will have a problem with new generations. Since we are talking about the the new the new generation right now, I, I think this comes. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask about the the Vogue uh, yes. uh, the Vogue phenomena. It, it came like less than 10 years ago i think it was first big big option was in 2013 if i'm not if i'm not mistaken and again it was with the younger generation and all the outrage and everything that came with the book so my i of course am uh, extremely against uh, however you want to define the vogue uh, phenomena but my point my, my question here is um, not what vogue is but was it that bad or is it that bad as as people like 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 in my in our circles portrayed as it to be uh, at the same time will it stay for a long time and will 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 it have like a long lasting uh, i don't know problems because coming from that yes yes this is a very relevant uh, very profound question it's not easy to to answer uh in this in this manner uh, when your tasty cooking is <laughs> pleasing my senses but i will try to to think a uh, couple of months ago i was a guest uh, i was invited to be a guest speaker by the slovenian philosophical society and i was speaking about this uh, vogue culture the name of my paper of my lecture was the revoking of interdiction in political languages I will try to speak about uh, idea of political correctness and idea of the, the Vogue culture and my, my research and my trying to understand uh, this uh, Vogue phenomenon and that we, if we called with these fancy terms, I think that we have dealing with old Maoistic or Bolshevistic type of, of practice. And uh, why I have this hypothesis? Because if you make some analysis, you will see that everything that happens 
in Vogue culture. Every elements of Vogue culture are very familiar if you know the history of, of, uh, of totalitarianism, if you know the history of uh, some kind of uh, Bolshevistic manners, and if you have a history of some kind of Maoistic manners. I will try with, what, with one example. One of the elements of the Vogue culture is deplatforming of some, uh, some speakers, some professors, you know, some protest of the university, some kind of occupying aspect, some kind of professor that is, has some kind of thesis that is not uh, so appreciated by the proponents of the Vogue culture, they make some elements of deplatforming, protesting uh, against their shaming and that kind of that kind of stuff. And if you understand, it's a very, very old phenomenon. Uh, our Institute of Philosophy here in, in Macedonia was built by one professor from Croatia. This professor was Pavo Vuk Pavlovic. He was professor in Zagreb, one of the greatest uh, Croatian philosophical mind. But in 1945, 46, when, uh, when he tries to teach philosophy. He was teaching about uh, plotting and he was teaching about uh, uh, Platon and plotting. And his students, which was part from uh, Bolshevistic youths in Croatia, go into his classroom and shouted loudly, we don't need plotting, we need Marx and Lenin in the lecture, we don't need plotting, we need Marx, we don't need plotting, we need Marx. And the students doesn't want this classical philosophical education, they want to philosophy to be teached only by the uh, prominent figure of this uh, Bolshevistic movement, and this professor was not so, it's not so guilty to be executed by the by the Bolshevik structure in the uh, post-war period, and he was by the by the sentence put here in, in Skopje, in Macedonia, not to be killed, but to be put uh, mm. here in Macedonia. And what to do this great philosopher? He, he built the Macedonian Philosophy uh, Institute. He built aesthetic laborator laboratory in Macedonia. And he's the founder of philosophical education in Macedonia. And we have to be thankful to this Croatian Vogue uh, uh, 46, 47 guys uh, who uh, deplatforming this Croatian philosopher. And he found a new platform, Skopje, and to build a new generation of philosophers. Philosopher. Something uh, uh, similar has happened with Anthony Simon, if you're familiar with one of the great inspiration of the leftist movement in 68, uh, Theodor Adorno, one of the great philosophers. He uh, speak also on his Frankfurt Institute for Social uh, Research, one of the famous leftistic institute in, in Frankfurt, and he was uh, not supported uh, university takeoff of the 68 protesters. And he doesn't, uh, he thinks that university must be free. Uh, be besides what kind of subject are yeah. teaching, university must be free and he thinks that protesters doesn't uh, have to occupy the university because university has to be some area of freedom and he doesn't agree with, he agree with the uh, diagnostic what are students struggle in 68 protests but uh, he doesn't agree with the some kind of solution they are they practicing and one of the students group it's called the Bussen in Akten it's a German word the tits in action they go to his classroom uh, they dressed uh, the girls are undressed themselves they're going completely naked to this Theodor Adorno professor and trying to um, not to seduce trying to aggressively uh, it's not erotically, I don't know how to, to put in, in words this kind of stuff. They are shaming he, uh, him with their nudity and trying to, uh, trying to make some kind of uh, political and ideological pressure to this great, great philosopher. And he was like an old gentleman, very ashamed, uh, very uh, problematic. He goes to, the, to, to his mountain in Switzerland, he uh, goes to to high mountains and he dies after with uh, after this yeah. kind of walking to the because he was absolutely oh. shamed and every aspect of this uh, woke culture is very very familiar with what happens in this bolshevik culture that's i think that uh, uh, because of the problematic uh, expression of the of the terms because you know the american leftists use the term uh, liberals and uh, the woke culture is connected with with uh, this idea of liberals, but it's, it's nothing liberal in that kind of <laughs> stuff. Liberal. It's completely the same what happened with Maoistic uh, movement, with this cultural action in, in socialist China, and it's completely the same what happened uh, after the 45 when we have uh, some kind of strong Bolshevistic uh, arrangements in other society. That's my, I will beg to your question. I think that the whole culture phenomenon is something that is recycling over and over when the young children and the young population forgot and forget uh, uh, precisely what is the dangerous of this intolerant ideology like uh, anti, uh, 
anti-liberal, anti-freedom, uh, collectivistic ideology. And when we have a generation that is not aware of the dangerous idea of this totalitarian mind that are used, uh, we have recyclation and we have a repetition of this kind of stuff. I think that Vogue culture is a new iteration of the old Bolshevistic uh, stuff that we that you think that uh, there is no uh, aspect of negotiation, there is no tolerance. Mm. You think that your idea is the great idea of the world and you don't have a place for other kind of idea. I mean, so and I think... It does not end with a full stop, it does, ends with an exclamation mark in the rhetoric. And that, that's, that's even worse, I, I think. When, when it comes to this, I think it will we will end the same. The most of people will have to to see in their own skin what kind of this intolerant ideology is, uh, and I think that the people probably it's it's uh, for regret, but people learn most of the times by his own his own back, and I think that American society will surely learn what is the dangerous, what we in Eastern Europe know, what is the dangerous of this uh, ideology, which is not tolerant, extreme ideology, collectivistic ideology, ideology that doesn't appreciate individual freedom and freedom at all. And I think this is uh, the latest iteration of the whole culture, but the terminology is problematic. Uh, this, you know, the Americans use completely problematic and completely unfounded the term liberal for some kind of... Uh, I will call it etatistic or bolshevistic approach to the social problems and social exceptions. See, that, that, that's where my question came from, whether it, it, are we in a cycle or not, because um, I, I adore Reagan and Thatcher and what they did, of course, with all their mistakes and everything, but like as, as best as it could have been, maybe. But my point is, they came because they were needed by the society and people. And maybe, that's what I'm saying, so maybe, we are always going into a, um, a counter-revolution all the time. So th that's why I'm even asking, I, I'm not sold on anything, but like that, that's how I feel. But before, before we continue with this discussion, um, uh, this is basically how, how this looks. Um, we, we have all the molds. Uh, I will put some uh, sesame seeds on top. Uh, you can put some parsley as well and just cook them for 20 minutes and that, that's pretty much it. And, and yeah, our, our Proya cupcakes, let's say, are, are done. Welcome again to the second part of the episode where we are gonna cook the dessert. Uh, so now I'm gonna cook the Liberty Cones, which is a very, very simple recipe where you mix like um, um, butter and chocolate, which I already have melted. Uh, you, put, you put in the mixture uh, a, a, a lot of um, nuts and it's your choice of nuts but I would I would suggest only pick one one type of nuts and then you just mix that um, in with with um, powdered sugar and afterwards you just get the cones out and fill them but the the best part with the Liberty cones is that again um, because Boshko, Boshko has two, two kids and we are, we are sort of helping him out in the future on, on uh, how, how he can spend more quality time with him. So we are going to do the, the, the fun way. So um, in, in some we are going we are gonna to put like uh, chocolate f flakes, uh, colorful flakes. Um, uh, then we have uh, some uh, coconut uh, uh, flakes as well and here we have, um, we have some shredded nuts as well. And then we have, we have like... Uh, a different uh, types of almonds and, and different types of nuts that you can put on top. Um, in, in good times, in, in summer, you can put inside inside the mixture, let's say, your favorite berry of choice. So that's pretty much uh, that that's that's pretty much it. What we are what we are gonna be cooking right now. Um, and if I have to interrupt, it will be very good uh, for my kids. Do you know why? Because it's early for ice cream and it will be some kind of uh, hot ice yeah, cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that I will you be very like... successful with this recipe. It's a nice idea, and Simon. Like... Thanks for my parenthood. <laughs> See, and you can lie to them. Ah, it's a, it's a very cool ice cream. And yeah, it's ice cream. <laughs> they, they have no idea. <laughs> uh, nice, nice solution. Thanks. So, but uh, before, uh, before I start cooking, I wanted to ask um, uh, you about... Uh, Let's say the symbols of liberty, and this this comes, I, th I think, from one of your books that was a philo uh, uh, compendium philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and and I'm really interested in why, for example, uh, did the Nazis chose the red color? Why did uh, why did the commies uh, chose the red color as well in in their flag? Was it was it um, 
let's say a coincidence that that this happened uh, the red color to be the the color of choice for the authoritarian regimes then the the question would be what are the liberty uh, liberty colors and then what's really important again i would say why did the anarchists and anarcho capitalists let's say chose the black and the black and yellow color so what was the deal with that yes uh, it was very this uh, this is my book uh, companion philosophy i think that uh, yeah. you mentioned and the first part of this book i called ontology of, of freedom and i tried to speak about some kind of very specific uh, items and topics connected with with liberty and one of the essays here in this book simon is uh, what you're saying about the symbols of of liberty and symbols of such a kind of political ideologies. We humans are symbolic creatures. We communicate through the symbols uh, much more than we communi communicate through the words because the symbols are some kind of expression of not so visible reality, but expression of something that is very real in our life. The symbolism of values, symbolism of ideological positions, symbolism of such a kind of stuff that is not easy to express with uh, with too many words, but we have a common sense to express with some kind of symbolic representation. And in political ideology and in political philosophy, colors are much more uh, present and they have some kind of ideological representation. The first, uh, the first uh, symbol of liberty, uh, we can trust, uh, we can trust it in the in the old Greek and, and Roman time, you know, in the Greek pantheon, the Greek has also the goddess of, of liberty. The Greek goddess of liberty is Efteleria, Efteleria. And the Roman equivalent of this Greek goddess is uh, the Roman goddess, it's called the Libertas. And this uh, Roman goddess is very similar to the Statue of Liberty, this allegoric woman uh, figure, which is called Mariana in the French Republican tradition. But it is an allegorical woman figure that symbolizes freedom. It's very interesting why freedom is always connected with, with the woman. Uh, it's a several philosophical explanation of this because uh, best one. <laughs> the best one because the because of the passion, uh, it, because the freedom and the liberty. Uh, you must love uh, liberty and freedom with the same passion that you must love a woman, and uh, it's the same, it's the same type of same type of passion. You sold me. Yes, you sold <laughs> this, me. this is the solution. But if uh, and it's a very very familiar and popular, you know, the Delacroix depiction of liberty leads the people. Uh, other kind of depiction in Macedonian uh, revolutionary struggle also use this depiction of allegoric uh, woman figure that that represents uh, freedom. But uh, when we speak concretely about the colors, uh, you know. And the colors are also part of this uh, political ideological uh, symbolism. You know, the red colors is connected with uh, socialistic, with communistic, with this totalitarian movement because uh, leftist thinks that the red uh, red color symbolizes the the blood of the workers uh, that was shared for political activistic uh, fight for their rights, and they think uh, that uh, red color is connected with this kind of bloody struggle for representation of the rights of the working class people. When we speak about uh, the anarchistic uh, movement, anarchists uh, use the black, the black color and the symbolism with the black is that they think that in the black colors we have an absence of uh, structure of oppression because the blacks is completely completely black and completely empty and the symbolism that if you use black like a political and a symbolic message then you think that there is no structure of oppression absolute freedom from any kind of any kind of oppression the the white color is usually used by the political ideology which was on the, the center and the yellow color is used uh, by libertarian and by classical liberal uh, political and ideological movement because they think that in the yellow color uh, you can symbolically found the um, the golden standard and in the yellow uh, color you can find symbolically the right of uh, uh, the right of possession uh, first of all, the self-possession and the possession of everything that you, like your own, are producing. Your capital, your goods, uh, your time, your values, everything that you uh, produce is in your possession and the possession of uh, the goods that you will create with your, with your freedom of expression and freedom to 
to do. That's kind. That's because uh, this is the why the, the Libertarian Party used the yellow card, which represents uh, some of the very crucial private ownership like a concept because you know that the leftist and the classical liberalism the key distinction is uh, the relationship through the the private private ownership and that's uh, completely it's connected with the colors of this what would you say that are the big uh, let's say signs of liberty let's say the first thing that comes to mind to me is always the statue of liberty but what would be like some, something that, not, not personally as well, but like generally accepted at the same time. But yes, this is the uh, the Statue of Liberty is planetary accepted symbol symbol of liberty because of this uh, uh, Marianne allegoric woman woman figure that uh, dominates to our appreciation and to our perception of uh, structure like the the symbols the symbols of liberty is a familiar very own but uh, today we have a very interesting new symbol i don't know if you want to speak about that kind of symbol because this symbol is on your head <laughs> hand. Uh, this is a very interesting very uh, new but old old symbol uh, research of the assyrian and babylonic culture find that in the oldest glyphic in the oldest uh, written letters we find the oldest depiction a uh, glyphic depiction of the word freedom and this uh, word freedom on this uh, Assyrian Babylonic language is called Ami G, the freedom and this symbol looks like <laughs> tattoo on your hand if you want to show to the audience and if you By don't way, want to show <laughs> The question was not meant for a self-promotion but no, yes, this is the first sign of liberty in recorded history liberty. so yeah, yeah <laughs> And I am very proud of yes, this. Yes, yes. <laughs> liberty here. has its own uh, symbolism, but it's not the case in the symbolism. It's, uh, it's the point is to fight for, for liberty, to believe in liberty, to believe in freedom. And you ask me in informal communication today, why, why liberty? Why yeah, th th that's what, why was I going to ask you why? why? Classical it's a very, very difficult question because I was educated in, uh, uh, in philosophy, Marxistic way. I was living uh, part of my childhood in socialist Yugoslavia. I was... Uh, reading much more philosophers which was connected with uh, socialistic idea and and how you understand how you read much more how you try to understand the history how you will uh, follow uh, much more of uh, philosophers that are not so known and so you will see that the liberty has one kind of that's my answer to why liberty has some kind of much more ethical uh, profoundness it's much more morally uh, satisfied that Except the other type. Do you know why? Because um, if you try to think utopian, in leftist utopia, you don't have a right to exist. In libertarian utopia, every leftist has a right to to exist. Because if they believe in their own utopia, they can live in their own communion. Because the the moral power of liberty is is what George Stuart Mill said. Everyone is free. Uh, the the limit of the freedom is the freedom of the others. But I think that in the leftist ideology, they don't understand this moral supremacy power that the freedom, uh, the limit of the freedom is the freedom of the otherness. Leftistic type of ideology think that their concept of freedom is absolute concept of freedom and everybody must live their kind of utopian ideological social structures but in libertarian type of utopia utopia with small you everyone has to create their own utopia if your utopia is communitarian utopia if your utopian is hippie utopia if your utopian is socialist utopia you can live your utopia in libertarian world but in marxistic utopia the libertarians doesn't have chance to live their utopia that i think that idea of liberty has a moral morally supreme concept in self that's the idea of morality in in other type of political ideology that's why i think that uh, when we speak about moral and ethical elements of liberal idea i think that it's a much more profound uh, than in other type of ideology see i i know that you love robert nozick and yes. everybody who knows nozick know, knows that he was next door to um roles and they were they were diametrically uh, opposite intellectually at the same time they were friends in in life but this is 
50 years afterwards or so, who would you say has won the, let's say, the philosophical battle on liberty? It's a, it's a very... I, I later in my philosophical career found Nozi because, you know, in the Macedonian universities, yeah. in Macedonian philosophical culture and social culture, you cannot find some kind of readings about the Nozick. Nobody speaks about that kind of uh, concept. Uh, but I found Nozi because Nozick, uh, like me, is a, a, first of all, epistemologist and methodologist. All the books of, of Robert Nozick is a books about ep epistemology, uh, about philosophy of mind. He only... Uh, write one book about political philosophy, Anarchy, State and, and Utopia. Yeah. All the books, all the uh, intellectual, philosophical, academic career of Nozick was career of epistemology. I also, my master and my PhD was connected with epistemology and I find uh, uh, Nozick in the other side. But when I read this Utopia, a State and Anarchism, I, I see very analytical, a very rational, uh, very profound approach to the philosophical and political question, especially to the questions about the relationship between the state and the the one individual. And his idea of uh, emerging of the state, his idea of ethical value of minimal state, his idea of, of minarchism is something that is very, very interesting for me. His uh, uh, thought experiments was, was very profound, you know, the the idea of the Matrix movie was Nozick idea, Experience Machine, uh, the sisters Wachowski that used in the Matrix movie was yeah. Nozick idea. The uh, one story about the slave is the Nozick idea. The Chamberlain argument is the, 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 Nozick, the Nozick idea. Everything that today the uh, libertarians use, such a kind of a profound argument, is, is Nozick idea. And Nozick speaks about one kind of idea that was very, very affected to me. That was idea about utopias without great you. Uh, what that means? That means that utopians are not some kind of uh, collective, uh, not some kind of uh, social world that we all must create. That utopia is something that you will create by your own world. And he thinks that uh, there is no one kind of utopia for me, for you, for I don't know, uh, other elements. Every person of us has its own idea what kind of utopia is utopia for him. And utopian society is a libertarian society that will uh, give the chance to every people to express and to live their own utopia. There is no element of repression and only element of, of collaboration and only element of uh, freedom to pursue your own utopian ideals. Not to put my utopian to be your utopian, yeah. leftist utopian to be all the utopian. Utopia is utopia only if it's not uh, with the pressure, it is not without repression. When we have repression, there is no such a kind of utopia. Only utopian concept in philosophy without repression is the Nozick type of utopia. And that's why his book, uh, I strongly recommend uh, to, your, to your viewers, it's something that, you, that everybody must read and to reconnect that kind of ideas that Nozick puts on the table. A must is a really, really, <laughs> really, really <laughs> hard. hard. <laughs> yeah, but, but it, it's not necessarily easy book to read uh, for it's starters. Not, yeah. It's completely because he's an analytical philosopher and he starts the book with, uh, you mentioned, with the uh, connection with the roles. He thinks that uh, you you must agree with roles or you must put in such a tremendous effort to riff, to, to not uh, agree with, with roles. But today we live over the roles. Idea of roles uh, is a roles idea of, of justice. It's idea that you have a moral right to taxation only if the tax money goes to the people they have uh, how do I call the Macedonian term is uh, nezaslužený ne nakvost. Unearned. Oh, to translate. Unearned. Unearned inequality. Un inequality. What that means? That means to, that uh, justific justification of the taxation is possible only when the state uses money to help the old people, the uh, <coughs> disability people, the kids, the, the mothers. Something that you have inequality, but it's not your fault that you're unequal. It Rawls thinks that this is the only morally uh, justifiable way to use the, the public uh, money that you, uh, uh, that you grab with the, uh, with the pressure. But uh, Eric, uh, more than then, 
that we have some kind of I don't know uh, uh, subvention of, of capital, such kind of uh, bailout, uh, such a kind of mm -hmm. using public money for the things that are not for the un. Uh, pleasant equalities. It's a very, very problematic. And today we live in such a kind of world that we have a, such a kind of etatistic approach, uh, such a kind of crony capitalism, such a kind of uh, wasting people money with the stuff that even Rawls wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't agree. I think that uh, today uh, etatistic uh, crony capitalism with the argument that this is some kind of social democracy is much more over the, the something that Rawls will accept it. And uh, the noise goes against the against the rules and then thinks that uh, only morally justifiable way will weigh if that we do that kind of taxation with uh, agree and that kind of that kind of stuff. That's why it's a very very interesting dialogue between rules and, and Nozick and today we still and coming back to what we said earlier, yes. they were next door, they were friends and yes. they disagreed <laughs> so much, but they disagreed and, and loved the discussion mm -hmm. because at the end of the day they both wanted um, um, the world to be a better place, yes, right? Yes. And what uh, today we see with the again with the woke, woke um, uh, let's say phenomenon, mm -hmm. they don't want discussion. They, it's yes. either or, it's either me mm -hmm. or my way or, or the highway, and that's I think. I I did not plan for the conversation to go this way, but at least this is my my take, and I'm pretty sure that Boschko agrees with yes. me on this thing. But this is Bolshevistic approach. If you, if you don't have a dialogue, if you don't have understanding, that means that your ideology is intolerant ideology. But uh, tolerance means dialogue, means understanding the position of the otherness. And we live in different society, but we have different types of otherness. The other on the political, on the ideological, on the cultural, on the linguistic others. And if you have some kind of totalitarian ideology that doesn't accept existence of the otherness, you have a problem. A Bolshevistic and neo-Bolshevistic ideology, extremely left and extremely right ideologies, it doesn't have capacity for tolerance, doesn't have capacity for dialogue, and doesn't have capacity for understanding the possibility of, of existence in society, other concept of otherness, other type of political otherness. And that's why it's very problematic, especially in Macedonian society, when we have emergence of these uh, intolerant ideologies from the far left and from the far right. The liberty is, is only answer, because we live in such a world that we can make some kind of mess and only struggle not to make some kind of political mess, only uh, capacity to not make the mistakes from the history is to fight for, for the liberty because I think it's the right way, not only the right way, it's the only way that can save society from this extremic, totalitaristic, uh, intolerant ideologies that is very popular into the young people, but we must educate it. We see we've come to the to the last part of the show and I always end the show uh, always in the interviews with how to find freedom in an unfree world and I think that this is extremely important yes. so what would be your your answer to to freedom in an unfree world I think that today we live in that such a kind of society with where this kind of uh, discussion is, is very 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 needed because I I communicate with the young people I communicate with the, the people which are trying to be profound, trying to be intellectual, trying to understand ideology, trying to understand society, the, the young people who are not happy what happens in, in our society and generally in, in European society, and generally in the world, and their answers, maybe because of the youth, maybe because of the lack of historical education, the, their answer is much more to the uh, extremely uh, right or extremely left positions. And that's why I think that we need much more liberal education. We need much more uh, education about idea of tolerance, idea of understanding, idea of freedom, idea of accepting the otherness, idea of, of tolerance. And this kind of idea is not so much present in our formal education, is not so much present in our uh, higher education, and is not so much present generally in our society. And I think that uh, some people like Lou and like me who are trying to fight for the idea of freedom, we must uh, try to fight uh, and to to fight for the freedom in unfree society through the through the education, we not uh, have to be in the trap to uh, to see that some kind of mess messianic trap. I called in my books messianic trap. Some kind of great leader will come, will solve the problem. We have some kind of enlightenment despotism. Everything will be okay. I, uh, that kind of stuff that will never, works. never, never works. It never, never happens. Works. That kind of stuff. Uh, the problem is that there is no right people. 
it's only right way. We can make some right ways, and if the unright people came to the to the power, we must kind of institution values and that kind of stuff because we cannot uh, wait some kind of messiah we must uh, from the ground uh, protect our society protect our children through the education about the real value because uh, the leftist or the, the right wing ideology speaks purely about the, the morality and if you uh, talk with some uh, leftists and some uh, right-winger, they always will put out the argument of, of morality. And I think that here in morality is the the key, the key fight. And if we have uh, good education, uh, if we had informal schools, informal communication, different type of school presenting the idea of liberty, the values of liberty, the moral power of liberty, the prosperity of idea of liberty, why free market is uh, morally acceptable, why free market is sustainably good than a totalitarian and etatistic approach of economy. If you share this story, I think that we will have success and I think that the fight for liberty understands that kind of, of struggle, how the young people will be uh, introduced the values of, of these uh, elements that we are talking today. But in Macedonian society it's very difficult to speak because Macedonian society is a messianic society because of the socialist uh, political culture. We still wait some kind of uh, center. We, we substitute uh, Belgrade with Bristol. Now we accept some kind of EU messianism. We expect someone else to, to save our political declinement uh, and political corruption. But I think that it's the rough way with the education, but we must start with, with the education. I think it's a key part. Well, b before we before we sign off, uh, Boško has uh, four books under his name. So, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so please tell our Macedonian audience where they can find your books. Uh, this is my book, a Compendium Philosophy. This is my the latest book about the comic uh, book art. It's called Aesthetic of the Comics. It's, it's my, my book about paradoxes of inductive logic and logic analysis of scientific knowledge. And all of my books can be found in uh, bookstore Ili Ili and Skopje and in bookstore Bunker, which was specialized for the comic book uh, culture here in Macedonia. Thanks for this opportunity to promote my books and I hope that some of your readers will find something interesting to read about the aesthetic of comics or something interesting about the philosophy of, uh, of liberty or philosophy of freedom, which is uh, one of the contents that was connected with this, my yellow and black book. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not the, <laughs> the accident why I choose this color. This is color that represents fight like, for freedom. <laughs> read between the lines, okay, folks. Okay, thanks. We, well, with this, uh, we are ending our, our fourth episode of uh, this show, Cook and Liberty. So until next time, take care and enjoy life.